Hey folks, this is Jim here. Um, before we get going, uh, the original video was quite lengthy, about an hour and 40. And given my really god-awful, terrible upload speed here, I decided to split the video into two parts. What follows is part one. I take you through some slides. I start discussing some research papers with you. That will conclude part one, and then part two will uh, continue, pick up where I left off in part one, to discuss more research papers with you, and then back to slides, and then concluding remarks. So here we go. Hello, friends. Welcome to Science Talk. I am your host and resident oceanographer, Jim Massa. So in this video presentation, we we'll be going back and forth between uh, showing you uh, graphics and showing you, um, sharing with you some findings from uh, several research papers. This video is going to examine why the Arctic sea ice is disappearing. If those of you who've been watching my channel for some time, know that you know i've explained how with the loss of the ice there's no, the albedo is reduced so when you have ice a lot of the sun energy is reflected back into space with the loss of the ice that sun energy now gets absorbed by the water the water heats up that specific heat is retained it delays uh the onset of freezing because it takes longer to cool down so freeze up takes place later in the year now the question i have received a lot of and is a perfectly valid question is why does the ice why is the ice melting earlier in the year after all the sun isn't high enough to impart sufficient energy to cause the melting. Why is that? So I'm going to address uh, that issue in this uh, video presentation, kind of go through some mechanisms for why this is taking place. So here we go. This is, uh, right there, there's the North Pole, and so it's staring right down from above. So this is, this is the Arctic Ocean. And we have some features here, right? Greenland, Canadian Archipelago, there's Scandinavia, Novaya Zemlya, right? Spitsbergen, Franz Josef Land, etc. Uh, Alaska, Bering Strait, Chuck Chi. Here's the Mackenzie River Delta. Uh, that's the uh, Brooks Range, North Slope. We've got some uh, basins here. You can see we have these shallow shelves, right? So we have the, uh, the, the Bering Sea through the Bering Strait into the Chuck Chi. Beaufort Seas, then on the Eurasian side, of course, you have the East Siberian Sea, uh, the Laptev, right, East Siberian, the Laptev, Kara Seas, the Barents Seas. And uh, there's Iceland down there. And what we're seeing at, this is basically within the Arctic Circle. That's what we're seeing here. So, here's some, now we identify some of the uh, features here. I, I mentioned the seas here. Well, the seas are sitting on the shelf. These shelves are very shallow. And as I ex explained in my ocean heat content video, I am proposing a hypothesis that warm water, the warming water that's now present in the Arctic Ocean, is sufficiently warm to cause the substrate to thaw, melt, the hydrates, the clathrates, thereby releasing methane, the methane that I have sh shared uh, with you in other videos that, that we see are actually being released. Uh, Igor Semelotov and his crew have uh, been doing uh, that research there. So when, during the ice ages, by the way, when the sea levels drop considerably, this is all land. And then the Arctic Ocean basically becomes like a little Arctic Sea. 
and no communication here. So we got the Canada Basin. It's Canada Basin, not Canadian Basin. Like Canada Goose, not Canadian Goose. So this is the Canada Basin. Okay, you got the Chukchi Plateau there. Then you have the Amerasian Basin here. A couple little ridges. The Makarov uh, Basin. The Fram Basin. The Nansen Basin. Overall, this is the Eurasian Basin. And you have the East Greenland Rift Basin. Remember, Iceland's down this way here. This is really a continuation of the rift zone. This is a very prominent feature here, the uh, Lomonosov Ridge. It really, in, in a lot of ways, separates the basins of the Arctic Ocean into two <clears throat> basins where the, the waters that are found deep in these basins really do not communicate with each other. So a couple other features, okay, the barren shelf to go with the barren sea, Kara shelf to go with the Kara sea, the Laptev shelf with the Laptev sea, East Siberian shelf with the East Siberian sea. Okay, so now that you have a, a handle on some of the important features, what I want to look at here, and this is kind of a review here, Notice it says wind direction. We have a high atmospheric pressure. So in the northern hemisphere, that will be a clockwise or anticyclonic rotation. We then have a low atmospheric pressure, which in the northern hemisphere is counterclockwise or cyclonic rotation. And taken together, this creates the transport drift stream that will push sea ice through the Fram Strait if the Arctic Dipole is in certain conditions where the positioning of the low and the high pressure systems are such that the airflow will push the ice in a direction that will take it through the Fram Strait. I did a video discussing this called the Arctic Dipole. Please check that out if you have not done so already. And another thing, you can think of this video as a continuation of my ocean heat content video. So if you have not seen that video already, I would uh, respectively suggest that you do so because what I presented in that video is in a lot of ways laying the groundwork for what we're going to be discussing here. So, so you may want to check that out first and then come back to this video. So this is uh, showing average ice motion in August 2007, August 2011. These, are, these arrows represent wind vector fields. Basically, the longer, thicker the arrows, the faster the winds are. And the arrows point in the direction the wind is blowing. So it's going from here to here. And it's showing you that this size arrow is about 10 kilometers per day of uh, drift of the ice. So you have wind that's blowing across the, uh, the surface, and that is called wind forcing that's going to push and move the ice. You'll notice in the left panel here, August 2007, if you look at the arrows, it will, it will take the ice through the Fram Strait. This one here, look how the arrows are changing positioning. The ice is kept within the Arctic Ocean. So you're not going to see as much ice being pushed through the Fram Strait. These, we now know, are governed by the Arctic Dipole the positioning of the high and low pressure systems. That's going to play a role in how the ice persists or melts earlier than what we have been seeing. So I, I want to just concentrate on the bottom two panels. You don't need to worry about this one here. So here we have a high uh, Arctic oscillation creating a certain mode of the Arctic Dipole, cyclonic mode. 
so that the flow is out the fram straight, the sea ice leaves. Basically, this is a high pressure system, so the flow is going this way, low pressure system, the flow is going this way, and it just pushes the ice right through. On the flip side of it, we have a low Arctic oscillation, so we have anticyclonic mode. The flow is within the Arctic Ocean Basin, the sea ice stays. Once again, we've got the high pressure system. It's blowing this way, the low pressure system is blowing this way, and as you can see, the ice kind of gets jammed up against the northern edge of Greenland. That's basically what these are showing. I want you guys to have in your mind, you know, that the Arctic Dipole is controlling sea ice movement in and out. Uh, well, the, uh, let, let's put it this way. The Arctic Dipole controls whether the sea ice will be pushed out the Fram Strait or kept within the Arctic Ocean. That's the best way to put it. So here we see some um, kind of a schematic of uh, what's going on. This here is a gyra. This is actually uh, the Beaufort gyra. It's a, a clockwise flow. And this is the actual movement of the water in the Arctic Ocean. Okay, so when Thanks to uh, Coriolis and uh, effects and pressure grade, uh, pressure gradients and that kind of stuff here, along with Ekman transport, what happens is that in we create a convergence zone in the middle of this gyra. Convergence zone, the water domes up, as we see represented here. Uh, H. Uh, high sea level pressure is basically what that is. So the, the water domes up in a convergence zone. There's actually would be a bit of a downwelling in the middle. Don't worry about that. If you want to learn about rotation, rotating systems, gyros, atmospheric systems, etc., Ekman transport, Ekman pumping. I did a video called Ro Rotating Systems. Please look at that one. We see some of the, uh, you know, some of the major rivers like the Lena and, and so on, all with their inputs. This would be a transpolar, uh, transarctic uh, drift there. And when you look at this, this is the uh, low uh, anti, uh, excuse me, low uh, Arctic oscillation, anticyclonic mode. So this diagram is what is represented here the ice stays in the Arctic Ocean. This is the opposite. This has a high Arctic oscillation, cyclonic mode. You can look at the direction of the arrows. They change. That will push ice out through the Fram Strait, as, rep oops, wrong way, as represented in B here. These are just showing, this is looking at the gyres from the side. I'm not gonna really spend a lot of time with this, but for our purposes here, when you see this little plus sign here, remember, this is a rotating system. This is flow away from you. When you see the, the dot here in a circle, this is flow that's coming at you. So you can see it's going this way and it comes back this way. And here's the shallow shelf where you would, uh, there is some evidence of Ekman onshore pumping, helps them to move some heat i.e. in the form of warmer water onto these shelves that uh, I indicated to you earlier. And as, we're gonna, as I'm going to show you, the intermediate water is actually warmer and is bringing, Ekman pumping is bringing intermediate warm water onto the shelf there that's helping to not only melt the ice from below, but my my hypothesis the warm water interacting with the substrate is melting and thawing the clathrates and the hydrates okay this is the gulf stream showing the canary island and north atlantic drift branches most people think of the gulf stream as a straight shot rib ribbon starts out that way around florida 
Because as you can see, there's all these little meanderings. We call these mesoscale eddies. And the mesoscale eddies basically pinch off from the main flow. So what we see here is the Gulf Stream is flowing up, and orange is very warm, yellow cooling down, green cooling down even further. And if you look at this, you can see the branch in this direction. That's the North Atlantic Drift. And it goes this way, and some parts heads over towards the Gin Sea, Greenland, Icelandic, Norwegian Sea, towards the uh, Barents Sea, and the other branches this way towards the Fram Strait. There's also a branch over here that heads towards the Canary Island with basically the African uh, current that helps create the North Atlantic Gyra. The flow here is fast. The current is narrow. Over here, the current gets very wide and it slows down considerably. More on that in a few moments. But I just want to, this is a satellite representation of using uh, color enhancements to show what the Gulf Stream is actually doing. As you can imagine, the physics is quite complicated. So I just want to, this is kind of a brief, quick thing here on uh, gyros. Again, go to my rotating systems video. But we have the, you know, winds blowing this way. I got the trade winds. These are the westerlies, right? When the winds blow, they push on the water at a little bit of an angle. Coriolis deflects in the northern hemisphere to the right. So this is the deflection due to Coriolis. So you're pushing the water this way. You're pushing the water this way. It's going to dome up in the middle in a conversion zone that creates a pressure gradient. And so water then flows down the pressure gradient. It goes from high pressure to low pressure. Coriolis also acts on that. And you get this rotation here. And there's also a downwelling in the middle, etc. This is what a gyra is. So this is going to be a lengthy video here, so I'm not going to go into a lengthy explanation of how gyras work. Again, my rotating systems video. So gyras is basically a vortex that results from balancing the wind stress curl, which is a type of torque. When the wind blows on the water, it's pushing on the water, that's the wind stress. Because Earth is, is uh, basically an oblate spheroid with fluid on it, the Coriolis creates a curl. I'll define that in a moment. So gyres result from balancing the wind stress curl, which is a torque, along with the horizontal and vertical friction that is found within the water, along with the geostrophic height. Geostrophic height is if I have a, a layered one, I'll go back to this uh, diagram. If I have a layer of water, here, here's, here's my layer of water. See how the water's domed up here? That has a higher geostrophic height than over here relative to that, that layer. In fact, this creates a higher pressure. There's a greater pressure on that layer because there's more water above that layer than over here. Okay. So that's, you know, geostrophic height is based on height of water that creates the pressure gradient and planetary vorticity due to Coriolis. Vorticity is a fancy way to saying that which has a tendency to rotate. And curl is a mathematical way to quantify vorticity. If you really want to know, it's the cross product of vectors, vector multiplication. Direction of the curl is important. Mesoscale eddies pinch off from the main flow of the Gulf Stream and is a result of planetary vorticity. That's what all these things are. All pinching off due to the fact the planet is rotating and you have the wind blowing and it's creating the wind stress and, and the curls, right? If this wasn't rotating, it would go in a straight line. But because the planet's rotating as you push on it, it's curling 
due to the fact that the planet is rotating, the fluid is rotating under another fluid. Uh, the atmosphere in motion is also follows fluid dynamics. We can say liquid, but the fluid. The difference is the viscosity and the density. So this is quickly, and we see this in the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific. So we see gyrus forming. And it's a result from wind blowing. We have a, 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 a curved surface. We have rotating fluids underneath, etc. So I want to discuss with you some facts about the Gulf Stream. It's part of the North Atlantic Ocean gyre that is basically the western current. This current flows fast. It is narrow. It flows fast due to western intensification. If you want to know what western intensification is, you'll need to take a graduate level uh, fluid dynamics class. It's, it's extremely uh, complicated and very involved. But western intensification means that the current is very narrow, it's very fast, but it's also very deep. And it's due to the direction that the planet rotates. If the planet rotated the other, in the other direction, then you get eastern intensification. But the planet rotates in the direction it does, so we get western intensification. The canary current flowing off Africa, forming the eastern boundary current, is very slow, very wide. Right? Right? The canary current is they're starting to heading toward the Canary Island, and then you get the eastern boundary, sometimes called the uh, west uh, African uh, current. This current off Africa, very slow, very wide. The western intensification results from balancing the wind stress curl, geostrophic flows, planetary vorticity based on Coriolis, and for the, you know, which is based on the direction the planet rotates. It also conserves potential vorticity. You have, a, you have a, a volume of fluid here. If fluid moves in to an area, an equal amount has to move out. Just like when fluid moves out, an equal amount has to move in. And because the Earth is rotating and the rotation is putting a, uh, an effect on the fluid, you're going to get all these mesoscale alleys, all these rotations. You're going to get vorticity. Remember, it's a tendency to rotate. So conserving potential vorticity is instrumental in mesoscale eddies pinching and breaking off the main flow. Flow is measured in teardrops. SV is the symbol we assign to that. Named after Harald Sviedrup, who's a Norwegian oceanographer, who first studied gyrus from a mathematical perspective. Now, he laid some important groundwork. He did not fully put it together, but he had some of the important aspects to it. Henry Stommel took Sverdrup's work further, successfully describing mathematically the North Atlantic gyra. It was Henry Stommel who realized about Western intensification. But Sverdrup did a lot of important things. He did work in the Arctic Ocean. He did work along the uh, uh, equatorial currents and counter currents. He did a, he did a lot of amazing things. Um, he died in the mid 1950s or so. So the work that he did, and he was proven correct on a lot of things, is pretty damn amazing considering, you know, there's no satellite back then and none of the fancy instrumentation we have today. So uh, it, it's only right that uh, the flow is measured in sphere drops uh, named after him. So what is, what is a sphere drop? It is defined as one million cubic meters of water flowing past a point per second. So it's giving you a volume per second. It does not tell you how fast that water is moving. It's just telling you how, how much volumes. Oh, we have two sphere drops per second, you know, past this point. Okay, two million cubic meters. So how do we figure out the velocity? Well, you place flow meters. You measure how fast the thing goes. But you can get an, an idea for the velocity of the flow by looking at the dimensions of the volume of water that comprises one sphere drop. 
So if I have a current that's 100 kilometers wide, okay, if it is just one meter in depth, then the length uh, needed to reach 1 million uh, cubic meters is only 10 meters, right? Because 100 kilometers is 1,000 kilometers per meter. So 100 times 1,000 is 100,000. 100,000 times 1 is 100,000 times 10 is now a million. So you can basically say, all right, the velocity is now 10 meters per second. Pretty fast. But let's just say we go on the other side. Will we find the Canary Eastern Boundary current? It's 1,000 kilometers wide. That's already 1 million meters. And if it's a 1 meter thick, that's 1 million cubic meters. The velocity is just 1 meter per second. So you can see it slows down dramatically. And these are not unreasonable numbers uh, for the Gulf Stream, by the way, and for the Canary uh, Eastern Boundary Current. Gulf Stream is mainly driven by wind stress, westerlies and trades, as I showed you. The North Atlantic drift up here, thermal hailing circulation. Through the Florida Straits, the Gulf Stream moves at about 30 sea drops. It increases to about 150 sea drops by the time it gets to Newfoundland. So it's about 30 down here, and by the time you get to Newfoundland up here, it's cooking along at 150 sea drops. Picks up in speed due to Coriolis, due to vorticity, due to pressure gradients, due to geostrophic flow, etc. It's about 100 kilometers wide, right? As I indicated here, it's about 1,600 kilometers long. The depth ranges from 800 to 1,200 meters deep. It's deeper on the western side of the gyra, shallower on the eastern side. The current velocity is fastest at the surface and decreases as you go deeper. Its fastest velocity measures about uh, 2.5 meters per second. Okay that we have good results for. Temperature range is 7 to 22 C. The salinity is about 36.4 parts per thousand, plus or minus. The density is in the range from uh, 1,023 to 1,027 kilograms per cubic meter. Warm water undergoes evaporative cooling as it travels north, which is wind-driven, causing the evaporation. As the water cools and we lose the water to the atmosphere, so you, you have the same amount of salt, but in lesser volume. So the salinity is going to increase. The water becomes denser and sinks. Thermal hailing aspect of it. Plus it gives off its heat, right? So the wind is evaporative cooling is giving off the heat, evaporating some of the water. It's causing it to uh, become colder and sink. But the heat gives off helps the folks in Scandinavia and the UK. Okay. Now I want to talk about, I guess I gave you some, I want to talk about the other side, on the Pacific side, because what the branch from the north, from the, uh, from the drift, right? The North Atlantic drift plays a, an important role in the Arctic Ocean as does the Kuroshio current. The Kuroshio current is the counterpart to the Gulf Stream in the North Pacific. It is also now on fast flowing, though not as fast as the Gulf Stream. It also creates a gyra. The California current is the counterpart to the Canary current in the North Atlantic. It's slow and wide. The Kuroshio, like the Gulf Stream, transports warm water and heat to higher latitudes. Like the Gulf Stream, it also splits. One branch called the Japan Current then travels into the Arctic Ocean through the Bering Strait. This is how we introduce heat into the Arctic Ocean from the Pacific side. We basically introduce warm water into the Arctic Ocean from 
through the Bering Strait and through the Fram Strait. During the ice ages, when the sea level is lowered, we have Beringia forming, and there is no flow of warm waters into the Arctic Ocean from the Pacific side. Like the Labrador Current in the Atlantic, which transports cold waters out of the Arctic Ocean, the Oyashio Current does the same thing through the Bering Strait as a counterflow. Now, the average flow of the Kuroshio is about 25 sea drops, considerably less than the Gulf Stream. Average temperature is about 12 to 24 C. Average width is also about 100 kilometers. The average salinity is about 34.5 parts per thousand plus or minus, which is less than 36.4. Now you're going to say, well, that's, that's only about of one part per thousand difference. That makes a huge world of difference. Subtle changes in salinity is enough to create density currents. Average density is about 1,025 to 1,026 kilograms per cubic meter, which is within this density range here, but we can see that it's a little bit higher. That also going to play an important role. Like the Gulf Stream, the flow meanders and is also due to planetary vorticity, mesoscale eddies pinching and breaking off. Oh, just to show you diagrammatically, here's the Japan current. Warm currents are indicated in this, I guess, orangey color. Here's the North Atlantic drift going through the Fram Strait. And this is the Denmark Strait, not by the way, down here. The cold, uh, the, the blue arrows are cold water uh, or cool currents. This here represents the uh, Beaufort Gyra. So, uh, kind of, so, so we have here, you see this uh, arrow down this way. This is the Labrador current coming. It's not indicated here, but the Yashio current would be a counter current to the Japan current. This shows the input of rivers, the Lena, the Yenisei, the Ob River, and of course the Mackenzie. This is bringing fresh water here. This is going to be diluting the surface water, lowering the salinity, and therefore lowering the density. In fact, creating what we call surface uh, water. And we get a bit of a mixed layer there. Then, you know, because you've lowered the salinity and you have the fresh water input, this will freeze up. But when you get the sea ice melting, you get the ice edge productivity, and so on and so forth. You've heard me discuss all this with you uh, before, but you know you have the surface water input. It, it it changes throughout the course of the year, but you have the surface water input lowering the salinity uh, as well. So here's yet uh, some more uh, showing more flows of water. You got the in through the Bering Strait, Japan current. Here's your Beaufort Gyro, a little bit of pinch offs here. Okay some flow through the uh, Canadian archipelago. Here's a flow through the Fram Strait. Some flow from the Barents that contribute, and this is interesting, and basically it follows these basins. Part of vor planetary vorticity, I, I'm trying to avoid getting too much into the weeds here, but the depth of the, you know, how deep it, the water is to, to the substrate, affects how tight or how wide the, the vorticity is. We tend to see strong gyroforms over uh, oceanic basins. You notice here this flow is following the Lomonosov Ridge right here. And there's a branch that splits off. It's called the Arctic Ocean Boundary Current called a boundary current because it's at the boundary between all the shelves and where it starts to dip down to the basins. It continues around, and then it got some of these other splits going through the archipelago. So these what, what, currents come in, they split around and move around. This here, that's your transpolar drift, and depending what the Arctic Dipole is doing, it will push the ice through the Fram Strait, or it goes this way. Bam! 
right into Greenland, as I showed you earlier. This kind of give you an idea of some, some of the major flows <clears throat> going on uh, in the Arctic Ocean. This is a little more, uh, a little more detailed. So basically, I'm just building up, you know, levels of complexity. And again, here's the transpolar current, North Atlantic current, the drift. Red is the warm water, blue is the cooler waters. These are the riverine inputs. And, uh, you know, you can pause these videos, uh, you know, anytime to scrutinize any of these graphics as you wish. But uh, it's showing a little more detail than a prior slide. And this is just showing the, the Labrador current coming this way. Here's the Gulf Stream going that way over the Grand Banks. Cold, warm, lots of fog, shallow, lots of productivity because the nutrients get entrained up here. That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> okay, so we're not done with the slides here, but I want to look at, take a look at some papers here. And when I look at these papers, when I share these papers, there's about six of them. I, right now, I will not do an in-depth because of time constraint. What I, the purpose of these, uh, sharing these papers with you is to show you some values of not only how many sphere drips are being uh, uh, brought into, you know, flowing into the Arctic Ocean, but what is the heat content that these waters are carrying. I will leave in the comments section, I will leave the URLs to what I'm going to share with you. I will, at a later point, do a deep dive on several of these uh, papers. So, give me a few moments here to set up looking at these papers. Okay. This is the first one here. Now, this paper was published in 2004. Here is the URL again. I will put uh, the URLs in the comments section. So when you look at the video, if you're interested in, you know, scrutinizing these papers, look for my listing in the comments section. So Arctic warming through the Fram Strait, oceanic key transport from three years of measurements. And uh, Ursula Schauer, Eberhard uh, Fairbach, along with Svein Osterhus and Gerd uh, Rohat. Okay, Journal of Geophysical Research. So let's see, get this thing to scroll. There we go. We present estimates of volume and heat transport through the Fram Strait for the period of 97 to 2000 from data of moored instruments. The annual mean. I can remove that. It probably makes it not readable. The annual mean volume transport at 78 degrees 55 uh, minutes north latitude were between 9 plus or minus 2 and 10 plus or minus 1 sphere drops northward and 13 plus or minus 2, 12 plus or minus 1 sphere drops southward. With a net transport between 4 plus or minus 2 and 2 plus or minus 2 sphere drops to the south. And you say, well, it sounds like more is leaving than is going in. Well, that's because you got water coming in from the Pacific side. And you got the transpolar current. Right? So the temperature of the northward flow of Atlantic water, which is typically abbreviated AW, had a strong seasonality, that's to be expected, with the minimum in winter, also to be expected. Nevertheless, the northward heat transport was highest in winter caused by the winter maximum of northward volume transport. Between 97 and 99, the annual mean net heat transport across that latitude increased from 16 plus or minus 12 to 41 plus or minus terawatts. Terawatts, you may recall, is 10 to the 12th. Okay. This, this resulted from a very strong increase in the heat transport in the West Spitsbergen current, which is to the east of the Fram uh, Strait. And to give you the mean of uh, annual values from 28 to 44, 46, and so on, 
in 99 and 00 in terawatts, which was not compensated by an equivalent signal to in the southward flow. Translation, more heat went into the Arctic Ocean than left. So there was no balance, meaning the Arctic Ocean got warmer. The heat transported in the south remained constant with an error limitation. Only half of the heat flux increase in the West Spitsbergen current was due to higher temperature. Half of it was due to a stronger flow. A similar increase between 97 and 2000 would have been sufficient to explain the warming of intermediate layers in the Eurasian Arctic. I'll be explaining what they talk about, the intermediate layers, when I go back to, this, to the uh, slides. Consequently, we suggest that a warming signal from the late 90, 1990s is presently spreading in the interior Arctic Ocean. Now, this is you know over 20 years ago already starting to see the effect that was seeing an increase in how much heat was brought in. As I said, they go through a lot of lengthy stuff here. I will do a deep dive on this uh, article at a later date. But what I want to point out to you is the heat being transported in. There is a heat imbalance, so that the Arctic Ocean is gaining more heat, so it's warming. That's, that's what they're saying. And it's this warming is spreading across the Arctic Ocean. So there's that. This was 2004. This is just the abstract, yeah, April 2016. Okay, this is just the abstract. But So I will just go through this abstract. No need for me to do a deep dive on this later on. But the heat content in the Arctic Ocean is to a large extent determined by oceanic advection from the south. During the last two decades, the extraordinary warm Atlantic water, AW, inflow has been reported to progress through the Nordic Sea into the Arctic Ocean. Warm anomalies can result from higher air temperatures with smaller heat loss in the Nordic Sea and or from increased oceanic advection. Also, remember, as I discussed in ocean heat content video, the upper five to 700 meters is now contained 68% of the 200 zettajoules of energy the oceans have ab absorbed. The zettajoules 10 to the 21. So there is a, a lot of heat now in the ocean. And it, it's warming up at the, at the lower uh, latitudes. And therefore, that increased oceanic heat content, along with the increased advection and the increased air temperature, is bringing all that warm water into the Arctic Ocean and it's warming things up. The Arctic water temperature changes from 7 to 10 C at the entrance to 6 to 6.5 C in the Barents Sea. Okay, so you can either look at it as a, a, a 1 to 4 degree drop, but when you consider the Pacific heat of the water, 6 degrees C is still considerably warmer than 0 C. In fact, uh, the Arctic Ocean usually has to cool down to about, oh, minus 1.8 C or so to start freezing. So there's still a lot of heat there that's going to prevent the freezing, the freeze up to take place. And uh, 3 to 3.5 as, uh, as the Atlantic water is leaving a Fram Strait entering the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic wa water passes through the shallow Barents Sea. You know, all its heat's lost due to atmospheric cooling and the Atlantic water loses its signature. Well, recent studies, again, this was published in 2016, recent studies are now showing that Barents Sea is becoming Atlantified. So it is not, nowadays it is not losing its signature. The Barents Sea is starting to show characteristics typical of the Atlantic uh, Ocean. Warmer temperatures, higher salinities. In the Deep Fram Strait, the upper part of the Atlantic water becomes transformed to less saline, colder surface layer, and the Atlantic water preserves its warm core. Well, that warm core is what's entering into the uh, Arctic Ocean, that warm core with the warmer water, the much warmer water, that heat diffuses upward. A significant warming high variability of Atlantic water volume transport was, was observed in two recent decades in the West Spitsbergen current. 
represented Fram Strait branch of the Atlantic inflow. The Atlantic water inflow through Fram Strait carries between 26 and 50 terawatts of heat into the Arctic Ocean. Notice a little warmer than the previous study uh, found well, it's about 16 years uh, later. Let's see what else they say. While the oceanic heat influx of the Barents Sea is a similar uh, amount, the heat leaving it through the northern exit into the Arctic Ocean is negligible. Basically, uh, referring to um, where the Barents Sea communicates more so with the Arctic Ocean. Called the Barents Sea Opening. The relative strength of the two Atlantic water branches through Fram Strait and the Barents Sea governs the oceanic heat transport. In to the Arctic Ocean, and hence the, uh, the, the flow that I showed you. According to a recently proposed mechanism, the Atlantic water inflow in the Barents Sea branch is controlled by the strength of the atmospheric glow over the northern Barents Sea, acting through a wind-induced Ekman divergence, which intensifies eastward uh, Atlantic water flow. They're making a reference to the Arctic oscillation and the Arctic dipole as to the positioning of the high and low pressure uh, systems. Uh, Ekman divergence is basically flow. When you have, like, for example, Ekman uh, onshore transport, okay, you're converging it onto shore. Okay? If you move it away from shore, it would be Ekman divergence. That's kind of what they're referring to here. And again, this is part of Ekman pumping, which I explain in the rotating systems video. And here, the, the Atlantic water transport in Fram uh, Strait is mainly forced by the large-scale low-pressure system over the eastern Norwegian Greenland air, uh, Sea. Again, a reference to the Arctic Oscillation, Arctic Dipole. Strengthening the coherent shelf break current along the eastern rim of the Nordic Sea. That's that boundary current I showed you earlier. However, long-term board observations in the Barents Sea opening in northern Fram Strait reveal Atlantic water transport in both Branches vary with the opposite phase of the interannual time scale. This suggests that in the periods of weaker Atlantic water flow in the shelf break current, the increased transport in the Barents Sea branch can also further weaken the Fram Strait branch. The anomalously warm Atlantic water inflow in the Fram Strait branch has a strong impact on sea ice conditions. All right, let's highlight that. Okay, the anomalously warm Atlantic water inflow in the Fram Strait branch has a strong impact on sea ice conditions in the southern Nansen Basin, while positive transport anomalies in the Barents Sea branch increase availability of oceanic heat in the Barents Sea and subsequently influence its sea ice cover. Translation, more heat's available to melt the ice. Basically, what they're saying here. It's warmer, it's bringing in uh, more heat than in the past, and that heat will affect sea ice cover. This brings us to the conclusion of part one. Part two will pick up from this point where I will uh, discuss with you the other articles I wish to share with you a return back to slides, and then finally some concluding remarks, all coming up in part two.